So I'm going to take you through a little bit of the background, give you some brief insights into what drives me, a bit about the colliery history, brief overview of how we acquired it and what we've been doing, a few more details into some of the archaeology and research, a look at our stakeholders and where we get our money from, and look at our forward plan. And also some of the learnings, insights and uh, observations that we've had. So uh, off we go. Um, and just for those of you that are interested, this is uh, a Mellings controller patented by Worsley Means of uh, Wigan in the 1920s. And it's just one of the many examples of some of the detailed research that we've been able to do. So um, I think we've covered that already. The picture you'll see there is one you'll be familiar with. It's uh, Elsica uh, and the, uh, the church at Elsica back in the 1920s. Um, so a little bit about, uh, about me, I don't want to overindulge it, but I've been uh, up and down to Yorkshire for the, and most of the rest of the UK coal fields over the past 35 years. Started off with an interest in railways and got an interest in, uh, became very interested in all aspects of coal mining. And for those of you at uh, my age or older, you'll recall that uh, 30 years ago, it was actually quite difficult to go across many parts of South and West Yorkshire without seeing a, without seeing a pit headgear or a, a spoil heap. Um, it's stuff that we just took for granted, didn't really pass much note and is now almost exclusively, almost exclusively gone. Um, if I can do a small commercial plug, I did produce a coffee table book on Yorkshire collieries, which you'll find if you Google me. Um, and I was encouraged to do that because I didn't set out to take uh, any form of an inventory of photographs. But when you go and have a look at them, you realize that's exactly what you've finished up with. I've been quite active in field and desk research for the past 15 years. I've published quite a bit. I've got quite a lot I, I want to do. Particularly interested in the Bristol coal field, but because of my uh, ventures up with uh, you folks, become quite familiar with many parts of the Yorkshire coal field. And we're looking down the uh, shaft now at uh, the Hemming. This is the main winding shaft at Hemmingfield. For those of you familiar with colliery setup, you'll see the cage guides on either side and all the rest of the normal rubbish that you get in a colliery shaft. Now, I hope you can, I can't move my menu bar. If I can, I don't know how to. This is intended to show you where Elsica is and Hemingfield is. And it's just, I'm assuming most of you know, it's just where my cursor is. The point that I wanted to make from this, diagram was that it shows very clearly the, pro the deeper progression of the coal field as you move eastwards. So if you look at the depths of places like Markham Main in Doncaster, they're mining from best part of 2000 feet or more, whereas, I do apologise, whereas back here we are back in uh, Hemingfield, we're dealing with a much shallower section at about two or 300 feet. And you can also, the map shows quite nicely, it shows effectively the capitalization of the pits because you can see as they go eastwards, they get fewer and fewer because they needed to be bigger and bigger and were more expensive. But you know all that, I'm sure. So let's have a quick look at the history of Hemingfield itself. So many of you be familiar with uh, Earl Fitzwilliam's Wentworth estate, centered on Wentworth. Um, we don't know quite why the Fitzwilliam family started to, uh, to dig coal. They probably recognized like a lot of the more uh, alert uh, aristocracy two or 300 years ago, that there's money to be made. Um, it started off with a series of small scale leases and 
then they started to get engaged in direct management. Uh, and this image here is one of the uh, Hemingfield, uh, one of the Elstica pits. And it's actually a cross section from some materials in the, in the Barnsley archive. And it shows the pit shaft. I do apologize. It shows the pit shaft. I won't use my cursor to show you, but you should, in the building in the center is a horse gin. And it's just one example of the wide range of uh, archival information that we've got available to us. The names of Joshua and Ben Byron may be familiar with uh, to some of you. They were quite, they were people that were known on a national scale. And these were the, uh, these were the Fitzwilliam collieries of father and son uh, who managed, who managed the collieries. So a bit about the history and development. Hemingfield's called Elsica Low. And it was started sinking in 1844. And it was one of the earlier phases of uh, development by the Fitzwilliam estate. They sunk pits out at Parkgate, nearer to Rotherham, um, and also other ones closer into, closer into Elsica. Um, and they were after, at this stage, they were predominantly after the Barnsley bed. The Barnsley bed is about nine foot thick depending on where you are. Very rich, very good quality coal, not faulted, lying relatively flat and particularly good for quite a wide range of purposes, so highly sought after. Fitzwilliams continued to sink pits locally. It took Simon Wood in between Hemingfield and Elsica um, in 1853. And they sunk Elsica, Maine and New Stubbin, which many of you may have heard of. But by that time, the Barnsley bed had largely been uh, worked out and so these pits were sunk to the park gate uh, which was uh, the next seam down. They'd used up so much of the Barnsley bed that the uh, local Barnsley bed pits had closed by 1920. Um, apart from a small section in Wentworth Park which uh, Manny Shinwell insisted was open casted in World War II which much to, uh, much to uh, all sorts of comments in the press and locally. Mining locally came to an end when uh, Elsica closed in 1984. Um, New Stubbing had closed not long before, and this was the end of mining very much in and around, uh, in and around Hemingfield itself. Quick look at the site. For those of you that have driven past it on Wath Road, it's a long linear site. On the southern end, we've got a building that's roofless, that's the uh, that's the electrical building. We've called it the fan house. There's a headgear behind it. And you've got two large buildings on site. One is the, the winding engine house and the ancillary buildings. And the other one is a Cornish winding engine house. Now our acquisition of the site went through two phases. We acquired the southernmost section in 2014 and the northernmost section a couple of years ago. What's not obvious from this picture is that there's a drop of about 40 feet down from the colliery down to the railway and the canal basin that's directly behind us. There is a superb stone lined canal basin directly below the colliery that was the recipient of the target for much of the, uh, the colliery's early dispatch. And uh, whilst it's outside our direct remit, the, obviously, one of the long, longer term objectives is to be a, able to get a restored colliery, a restored railway and a restored canal canal with all of the things that go with it. Opposite the pit on the south, south uh, eastern side, you can see we've got pit row, which is where the colliery officials lived. This just looks like a block house, but it's actually a truncated Cornish winding engine house. You can see where the chimney is, is where the beam was removed. Um, and not very many people know that, as they say, but this is effectively a Cornish engine house with the top story removed and a brick built extension built onto it. This was used as a dwelling until about three or four years ago. And this is the part of the colliery that we've just managed to uh, manage to secure. A um, bit of text about the history. Started sinking, started 1843. 
the two pits, a coal raising shaft and a pumping shaft, 24 inch vertical winding engine, a 74 inch college pumping engine, coal production that is alleged and reported to be a thousand tons a day, which I still think is quite, quite high, but this was going out by the late 1840s. There was no railway line at that stage. It went out by the canal and when the Elsica branch, as soon as that, as soon as that was opened. Because it's the Barnsley bed, it's very fiery and flammable. And there are a couple of uh, additional ventilation shafts sunk. Just as you cross over the bridge, when you're coming, the railway bridge, you're coming between Elsica and uh, Hemingfield. If you look carefully in the uh, undergrowth, you can, see the, uh, you can see the remains of them. The next piece of mechanical intervention was they installed an under underground haulage engine winding down the shaft, but installed on the surface. Colliery closed in 1920 because the Barnsley bed was exhausted. Bear in mind, Elsica Main was already working the park gate seam below the Elsica Main, below Hemingfield. They stripped out all of the ancillary buildings and the site passed to the South Yorkshire Mines Drainage Committee. For those of you who are interested, there is a separate article on the South Yorkshire Mines Drainage Committee that's available on the Friends of Hemingfield Colliery website. Um, it's a whole separate sub story, but I won't bore you with at this stage. And um, from then on, the site was progressively modernized, pumps were electrified, wooden headgears dismantled, um, and the, it remained open for pumping, and the workings were still open until 1985 when Elsica Main closed. After that, the, uh, the, the, pit, the shafts were allowed, to, uh, were allowed to come back up to the water level. Um, and after that, the site progressively deteriorated until we acquired it in 2014. So we hadn't seen this picture until about three years ago when one of a uh, gentleman called Mr. Oscliffe rocked up and said, how do you see this? So this is a photograph looking from, it's actually looking over to the northeast with, uh, with, the village behind uh, Elsica is over to the uh, is over to the left, and the railway line tucked behind the pit. You can see why it was called the bicycle pit because it had two pit wheels on top of one on top of the other. The building directly on the left, with the small chimney, is the only one that's still standing. Although the part of the walls are still with us. This is like, this is, you can see, it's one of these lovely old postcards that, uh, that enlarges beautifully, but it's the only one that we have come across of the pit when it was working. So if anybody comes across any others, please let me know. So in chronology, this is the next picture available of the pit. And this is about a one inch by two inch picture that's enlarged. And this is once they'd started demolishing the pit. Um, after it was uh, after they did stop coaling as part of the conversion, and you can see it's taken from the opposite side, from down on the canal basin. But you can see the three humps of the screens building, and the and the bicycle pit of the headgear. We're really unfortunate this is not clearer than it is, but uh, we've done our best. This is something that turned up. About three or four years ago, we were having our snap in the pit yard and a lady turned up with a couple of plastic bags. And it's one of those things that we all treasure. Somebody said, oh, they were going to chuck these and I thought you might be interested. And it turns out there's a whole load of original photographs and related material from a gentleman called George Beaton, who was one of the historian, local historians who'd sadly died. And again, it's a reminder for all of us to make sure that any of your historical material is put in other people's hands before you uh, leave this mortal world. Because guess what? You know, your kids may not value it the same way as you do. Unfortunately, that's what this lady had managed to do. What you see there is the old bicycle headgear and the concrete one that replaced it in, in 1940, complete with, uh, complete with the cement mixer. Fast forward to 1970 um, and really nice view over the site. You'll see the contrast later on. This is still a pit. The, uh, this is still a pit that was being used for accessing the workings, repairing 
the pumps and so on and so forth. So you can see there's very little tree, there's little, very little tree there. You can see pit row in front of us with no rear extensions um, and only one car. It's the benefit of cars. I think that's a Mark II Escort, so we can date it to the early, early 70s. We'll see a few more of the pictures. These were taken by a colleague of mine, well, Alan Hill, a very kindly shared, shared them with us. You'll see a few more. You'll see the, you'll see the change that the, the, the pit's gone through. Just as a reminder, from left to right, uh, as you're facing the screen, you've got the, uh, you've got the electrical house on the left-hand side, the winding headgear, the, the lighter winding headgear, behind it, the winding engine house and its extension in the middle, the pumping in the pumping shaft and the truncated Cornish engine down on the uh, down on the on the on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. Now I know you've seen loads of pits and you kind of go, I'm sure, well, why did you bother with this? Well, why did we bother um, purchasing this? The reason we bothered is the last one of its kind. South Yorkshire particularly used to be full of these sorts of sites when the NCB was in play. Um, and as the collieries were closed and demolished from the 80s onwards, they were just they were just removed. You probably didn't even notice when they went, but you notice when they're not there. Its survival as a pumping station made it very, very, very unusual. Um, and there are no other small collieries with a complete set of buildings. I use the com word complete loosely in situ. You've got house over in the over in West Yorkshire which is a much larger later pit so that's why it's important that's why it's important it's conserved um, and its size makes it a bit more manageable for smaller groups such as ourselves so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these but these were again photographs taken when the cages were still in use uh, the cage on the right hand side is actually preserved in cap house um, for those of you not familiar with the site, this is the view from the other side and the drop down to the, uh, I'm standing with a canal behind me, the drop down to the, uh, to the buildings, from the buildings with the, the railway lines hidden by the little spoil bank um, is, is quite obvious. Fast forward to 1990, where I started inflicting myself on the people that were um, going around and inspecting these sites. You can see the start of, start of undergrowth, but the pit's still mostly, mostly intact. Pits were being visited at this stage once a week by a subcontract team appointed by British Coal to make sure that they were just, they were just being dipped. They'd stop pumping it, but they were, they, were being, they were being dipped. They were being dipped to make sure that the water wasn't rising because these pits were still required. To, they still needed to monitor them to make sure the water didn't overflow into the working pits. So that's 1990. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but these are some of the architect's drawings we had done for the, uh, for the building at the time where we did the uh, conservation management plan. Fast forward to 2014. It's a bit Angor Wattish. Um, so by 2014, oh admittedly, this is the summer, that you could not see the main pit buildings. <laughs> That's just an example of how much uh, of how much foliage grows over 25 years. Um, so when we got it, our first task was to take all the trees down to prevent further damage. Um, and I'm still burning the remains of the remains of them, and there are still some trees up there. It's taken about five years to clear the trees and the stumps. It's a huge piece of work. Um, but one of the things you have to do, because the roots are highly invasive and damaging, many of you have worked on colliery on archaeology sites will be aware. 2016, we've made a bit of a hole around the, uh, with the foliage. There's still plenty around it. We've taken a bit more of it back. Yeah. You'll see the building is roofless. The building's roofless because some of the uh, lads decided that they'd come and uh, remove some of the copper and the electrical equipment. Um, and to, to make that effective, they set fire to the cables. Um, they went a bit wild and they set fire to the roof. So that building is still roofless. In many ways, that's one of the things that catalyzed our intervention. Because as soon as a building gets roofless, it's the sort of the beginning, the beginning of the end. Yeah. So that was uh, that was 2016. 
this was also 2016. The main winding engine house had some large gaps in its roof with trees growing through it and some rotten timbers. And it would have taken perhaps just a, a bit more of a violent storm than usual for it to come off. Um, we were extremely fortunate that we had some, uh, we worked closely with the Dern Valley Landscape Partnership. Um, it was a HLF funded scheme in play at the time. Um, and our colleagues in uh, the Elsica Heritage Centre and Barnsley Council. And we were able to secure some funding from then for re-roofing it. Um, and that was match funded by the Association for Industrial Archaeology and, um, and a couple of other groups, um, because it's a very large sum. It's a sum of about 46,000 pounds, which for a small volunteer group is uh, just, just impossible. And so what it, did, what it did by having a, by being able to re-roof it, we conserved the existing materials um, by uh, doing it properly. We were able to make the building safe and weatherproof. So a huge step forward. Um, have a quick look at what remains. So a bit of a different view of the Cornish engine house from up top, uh, up top of the uh, of the headgear. So what we've got left on site is a couple of open mine shafts, um, one of which is grilled and you can see down it, the other which has got a plate over it. We've got a couple of winding engines, uh, electrical afraid, but uh, one of them, one of them is a steam conversion. We've got what's nationally important and possibly internationally important, a complete vertical winding engine house from 1846. You saw the Mellings con uh, overspeed controller earlier, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a whole load more to be discovered. Every time we go there, we find, we find something, something, something new, not always something big, but certainly something important. A lot of text here, so I rattle through this. So I made a verbal offer to purchase the site with Savills. Now, Savills are a estate agent that deal with country houses, as I'm sure those of you that live in country houses will know. Um, and Savills, I think Savills didn't really expect to be dealing with the disposal of, uh, of colliery, uh, colliery buildings, but uh, they did, and we were, and we struck a deal fairly quickly. Um, we set up a we set up a company limited by guarantee to uh, to handle this. It took six months to go through all the legal uh, shenanigans with the uh, liquidators, but we got there in the end. And we started tree clearance and recovery. And when we started, there were two of us, me and Glenn Shepherd, nobody else. So you start on these things and you think, goodness me. I hope somebody else comes and joins us. And guess what? Sooner or later, somebody does. But uh, this is about sort of getting getting started. We had a lot of help. We had a lot of people come and got stuck in. And a lot of help from Sheffield University School of Architecture did what they call a live project, where we got the postgraduate uh, architectural students to come up and do some schemas. And the work they did absolutely blew me out of the water. They did some fantastic stuff. It was really nice to see bright young people let loose on a site and, a, and an industry that they weren't familiar with. Um, we had the Northern Mines Research Society um, pay for security doors to install in 2014, which made the site safe. We had the DVLP fund an environmental survey and the conservation, conservation and restoration plans. We had Sub Britannia fund the owl survey and its rehousing. So I forgot to mention our resident owl. Um, I spent uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few weeks, as did a number of other people, removing a few tons of bat guano, which is not the most joyous of occupations, but these things have to be done. I told you about the roof work. Uh, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the um, HLF in 2017 and in a couple of years ago we were given some funding by them to purchase Pump House Cottage which is the Cornish engine house and we are in the middle of uh, working our way through that 
we have just received uh, late last year. Grade the site, the whole site is now grade two star listed, which we're absolutely mm -hmm. delighted about. And it's a confirmation of what to many of us seemed like a leap of faith back in 2014 when we first started. Um, so it also fits in very nicely with the Elsica has designations and all of the exciting plans that uh, are being put together for that for that area. So it's really nice to have our, I suppose, our faith and our faith and our goodwill sort of recognised in that uh, in that term. So I'm conscious of timing, so I'll uh, I'll just give you these are just some of the highlights. Um, we found that the electrical switch house, switch house, switch building was built on top of the underground haulage engine beds, which themselves were been built on top of an earlier fandre. So just in one building, you've got three distinct layers and there are very few, you know, these are, you know, whether they're nationally unique, you can argue about, but they're certainly, they're certainly, uh, they're certainly important. So every time you lift some, you lift some soil, you find, you find something there. The site's full of large cast iron plates because they had plenty of them and they were used for, they were used for paving. Um, work on a rear terrace where I found that they dumped tub chassis and flat rope, flat ropes, uh, flat winding ropes uh, in, amongst the, in amongst the debris. Previously, a few years back, I went to, uh, I talked my way into the uh, Newcomen Engine House at Westfield at Raw Marsh which was used as the store for South Yorkshire Mines Drainage Committee's uh, timesheets. And I've liberated a load of materials from them. We're in the middle being led by John Hunter and Chris Jones, a very large research program on mine water management across the valley. We've done oral history interviews with surviving miners and there's still plenty more to go. I mentioned already George Beaton's files. This is file of photographic material that was just gonna be dumped. We have amongst our volunteers, we've not got a huge number, but we really have, we've got uh, Chris who's with us tonight. So Chris is a real guru in terms of finding material. So Chris is a trained librarian and archivist and uh, is a fantastic help. Um, John Hunter is a trained geologist and does some, uh, has done some superb work on, on local history. We'll also have on my network a number of other people, including a gentleman called John Barnett, who some of you may be familiar with, who was uh, the ex-archaeologist uh, for the Peak District, uh, Peak District Park. So we've been able to call in our network for a lot of, for a lot of these things. Um, I'm just going to go quickly over this. This is one of John Barnett's pieces of work. So John Barnett surveyed the, uh, the engine beds for the underground haulage engine. And George Beaton's materials contained a drawing of the layout of said of said uh, of said engine beds together with the cylinder dimensions. And again, these are bits of jigsaw puzzle that are able to assemble. This is another one. So we've got on the left, Chris found amongst the NCB files the specification for the Cornish engine, which was removed from Kexborough Colliery up at Darton and it gave all the details of it. Unfortunately, it didn't give us the maker. Um, I'd had no idea of that, but Chris, Chris found that out. So we're able to work out both the engine dimensions and where it came from. The sheet in the middle is the, uh, is the detail of the, uh, some of the timesheets. So I managed to find an A4 size box full of the timesheets from South Yorkshire Mines Drainage Committee. And from that, I was able to produce in some detail what the daily routine for these guys was back in 1940. And that's the subject of an article that was produced for the Northern Mines Research, uh, Research Committee. And on the right, you'll see that one of Allet's pieces of work that uh, John and Chris found that describes, if you see, the sinking of a water pit. And I have never seen description of water pits until a few instances before we came to, uh, to Elsica. Particularly important because in the, when, you when you can't have a boiler pond, you sink a water pit. 
I won't elaborate on it at this stage, but it makes perfect sense and explains why there are so many pit shafts uh, across the shallower part. Not, not all of them are pit shafts. In some cases, they're vertical boiler ponds. Um, and I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you some more of the detail of those later. Again, these are the sorts of things that we find out. May not be interest to anybody, but it's certainly interesting to me. So, this concrete pad, a modern concrete pad, nothing to do with archaeology, but actually it is. It was completely hidden by tree roots. There was a blanket of ash trees that the roots that had grown completely over it. We lifted them off in one go. Never seen anything like that before. It is the pad for the emergency winder and the alignment of the sheaved in the headgear was changed when the winding engine fell out of use in the 1970s to enable the use of a mobile winder. A mobile winder needs a solid concrete pad to, uh, to tie itself down to. And the two small indents in between the, at the end of it are the brackets that are cast in to allow the, the, the winding pad, uh, the mobile winder to be secured to the winding pad. Not very exciting, but important in terms of understanding the story of the pit. I think I've mentioned already, we did a lot of chainsaw work and you can see some of the results of some of that. Um, so we had to take it down and then we had to poison the stumps and remove the stumps three or four years later. And the last one came out late last year. Lots of brick chipping as well. So we've got all of these old hand handmade bricks that uh, that we've had to clean the uh, clean the cement off. Not very interesting, but it means that when we come to rebuilding the walls, we'll need them. It's not a caravan site before behind. It's where I stay when I'm up and working. For the brick aficionados amongst you, this is an example of sort of the stuff we've found. Um, We've got about 20 different brick sites, uh, brick makers so far. You know, again, something or nothing, but it's a, just, a, just a reminder of all the different facets of industry and industry, industrial archaeology that are available to us. Um, so the stakeholders for us are particularly important. The community of people that we work with are absolutely key. So the site owners and their agents were key in terms of engaging and involving with this. The neighbours, the railway on the one side, the neighbours on the other side, the Wentworth estate um, on both sides of us. Our funders and our donors, we've been very lucky. I've mentioned most of them, but let me mention them again. Northern Mines Research Society, Dern Valley Landscape Partnership, Association for Industrial Archaeology, Subterrana Britannica, visitors, and also Barnsley Council. In the time since I've done this, we've had donations. We had a COVID grant from Barnsley Council, which enabled us to uh, pay our insurance, pay our insurance fees. Um, we've worked closely with Barnsley Council, um, the planning people, highways people, rating and the environmental team. Uh, people will often talk down the local council, but we've had some brilliant support from I mean, I think everybody knows John Tanner. John's been a mega star, but John and there's a whole load of colleagues, Tegwin and all of the staff at the, Elsa, the Heritage Centre, and also lots of people from the uh, from the council itself. But a lot of help from the dedicated team that the council employs that keeps a record of mine shafts. Um, I've, local councillors, local community, the industrial archaeology community as well and et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important that these relationships are developed and maintained. So let's look forward for a moment. Here you are, you've got another picture of, so the sun doesn't always shine on the Hemingfield Colliery, but it's very nice when it does. It's particularly sad that the Elsica Heritage Railway went into liquidation, because one of the really nice things about working on site, you work in there, and the steam trains chugging back and forth. And when they're on the service trains, you wave, at the, uh, you wave at the parents and children on the train below. I'm sure it will come back, um, but it's a, you know, it's a great local asset and a great local site. So we have got the builder, we've got the winding engine house with its roof on. We've not done any work in terms of restoring the winding engines because that's one of the things to come. We have part of the h &F grant enabled us to re-roof this building that you see in the picture. 
it had a flat roof, which those who work with flat roofs know they're a pain in the neck because they leak. So we've had it re-roofed. That brick built extension is a, it was built um, by the Fitzwilliam estate, by the South Yorkshire Mines Drainage Committee um, to provide a kitchen and a second bedroom for their pump attendant. The only problem was they didn't underpin it very well. So progressively it's moving away from the main building um, and needs underpinning. So there's a lot of work needed to do that. Um, I mentioned before, uh, we would like to get the winding engine moving. Um, it's an electrical one, so hopefully we'll be able to put a small electric motor on it and just show it. And I know most of you will have seen a winding engine move. But bear in mind, we're aiming very much at a younger generation who will not have seen this before and who will not have much experience of what a pit entails, what coal is, or why there are so many, why there are so many coal mines across across South Yorkshire. So one of our purposes in conserving this is a visit, visual prompt and reminder and a go-to location just to remind people for the period to, about the period where coal was particularly important to our area. So looking back at about 2016, taken from the headgear after the roof had been burnt, you can see the uh, you can see um, some of the work that's entailed in terms of bracken removal and so on and so forth. Um, so what would we like to see? The winding engines moving. We'd like to see a halt on the Heritage Railway so that people can get off the train and come and see us. That was part of the original plan and I'm sure it will come back. We looked at the conversion of the Cornish Beam Engine House as a rental property. That may or may not be possible, but uh, it's now grade two listed, so, uh, um, so who knows? We'd like to see the clearing and dredging of the canal basin. Um, quite a lot of work, but those of you familiar with the site, there's um, some superb masonry out there. Um, it's not too badly damaged. We'd like to see a refreshed management team um, because uh, guess what? Uh, I can't always sustain driving up from Hampshire to there. Um, and uh, quite a lot of our existing team have, uh, have really uh, burnt the candle at both ends. And we'd like to see sufficient income to ensure the site's long-term viability. So we don't have that at the moment. We're very much, uh, should we say, pillar to post. Um, so all of your donations are very welcome should you choose to make any to us. So these are the sort of the main priorities for us going for us going forward. You can see from this picture, by the way, something I haven't covered before. You can see in the near the nearer building is the very tall vertical winding engine house. Um, inside there, it largely open, uh, very much as it was when the engine was removed. Um, the building behind it is where the the winding the the later winding engine or the winding drum was installed, and also the winder for the for the pumping shaft. And you also see the respective heights of the uh, the height the topography of the site from here. So I'm getting towards the end. So summary in terms of in terms of what we've learned. These chances to do this don't come up, don't come up very often. Um, so it was a bit of a leap for all of us, um, but so far so good. Um, it was a confluence of circumstances. I was in a position, a fortunate position, to know. A little bit about the site at the time it came up for disposal and in a position to be able to work with some fantastic stakeholders and volunteers um, and we've all got a real buzz out of the out of the archaeology on site every time we go on there we find we find something of note a lot of engineering applications a lot of quite simple working out what it is you know from mini door handles from when the site was used as a, a tip recently to uh, you know, some major castings in terms of working out what they were used for. There's a mass of research that's been done um, and it's being assembled, but it's still way off being public publishing. Those of you that work in terms of what I call outreach from your society will know how hard work it is and how long and hard you need to work engaging and enthusing the local community. 
but you have to do it. You can't, uh, uh, you can't, uh, you can't not do it. Particularly important for us, because the friends of Hemingfield Colliery are blessed with having a chair that's uh, a southerner. So uh, you know, the sooner we replace him with a proper Yorkshireman, the better. Um, the other learning is that uh, volunteers. Vol managing volunteers is always a bit of an art rather than a science and you have to let them find and follow their own areas of interests um, and they need to be led and inspired not uh, not sat on and managed um, and guess what when you get moving good things happen it is harder to do it from a distance but um, I've been enthusiastic enough that I've still been going up there until the until lockdown I've learned to ask for help and again learn to ask you guys and girls for help we need uh, your volunteers we need your outreach we need you on site we need your money we need everything that you can give us and i know you get lots of calls on this sort of thing but there's nothing wrong with asking um and i'm sure you're all with me and that the more you put into this the more you get out of it uh ask me if i would do it again later on perhaps but those are those are the uh, those are the main points now there are some more pictures but i been talking now for 40 minutes and I suspect it's probably time for me to stop and pass over to Tony but I'll leave you with some of these which are some of the George Beaton photographs we think they are photographs taken when the pit was open if you remember Hemingfield Colliery they stopped working the coal in 1920 but it's the workings were open until 1985 because they weren't flooded. And we think these are some of the pictures of the flooded workings. Oh, there's just a couple of archeology span before I go. So there's nothing that exciting about brick paths at, at on the left until you find them and work out what they're there for. And on the right, some of you, the more senior ones amongst you may remember these, these are wet cell batteries. So these are the bank of wet cell batteries used immediately after the Second World War for the miners' cap lamps. And I think at that stage, you've probably heard enough of me. So I'm going to, I can quite happily talk for more, but I'm going to stop sharing screen and pass over to Tony for questions. Right. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Steve. Um, I've uh, learned quite a lot there. Uh, let's see, let's uh, put up the right symbol. <laughs> And uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I, I knew uh, I knew of the the colliery, of course, but I've never ever been there. And uh, although I've been to the mining museum further north, and I uh, have been down a few pits in my time on Tyneside when they still existed. And well, just one of the things I didn't say was that you're all very welcome on site on our, <laughs> on, our on our open days. So consider yourself all having an open invitation. Sorry, we, Tony. We, we will turn up. Yeah. I've, I've also been down quite a few holes in the ground with uh, with John Barnett in the Peak ah, District. And it, in fact, I don't think there is a hole in the Peak District. He's not been down. So, <laughs> and uh, my the one thing that struck me is, uh, will you uh, at any point have any access underground? No. Yeah, yeah, in, so, a, in a word, no. Um, mm. Because it's the Coal Authority has some fairly careful controls around access to mine openings so we are quite tentative about our position as having a couple of open mine shafts on site because that does attract a lot of a lot of interest so there are some subsurface structures uh, underneath the electrical house but they're you know within 20 feet of the surface and these are effectively under crofts and engine beds rather than rather than mine workings Tony right uh, I can invite people to throw questions at you. I, I've got one that's appeared on the on the chat function, which says, "How many people were employed uh, at various times uh, of this pit's existence uh, at, at the end and at various times during its existence? Have you, have you got a, a, a payroll record for a hundred years of it?" <laughs> it varied, but from memory, it's in the order of three or four three or four hundred in its period because it was worked quite intensely mm. they wanted to take the Barnsley bed out as fast as they could because it was just it was uh, you know I'd say money for old rope that's unfair but it was it was highly lucrative 
And so that's why, you know, again, I'm sure most of you are familiar that long that long frontage at, Wem at uh, Wentworth uh, was largely paid for by coal mining. <laughs> yeah, uh, three. Uh, that's quite a big workforce, con considering the size, of the footprint of the actual. Yes, it is. Mm. Yeah, they must have been queued up to use the pit baths. Uh, right. Anybody else got a question? I see. Uh, Chris Jones has posted uh, a, a link to HemingfieldColliery.org people miners, which gives some numbers. He says. <laughs> Uh, that that link should appear on, on other people's screens as well. Yeah, we've got quite a lot of genealogical information. Um, Chris, has, Chris and colleagues have done a have done an awful lot of work. There's still more. There's still more to do. Um, but you know, part of our purpose is to sort of reach out and encourage others to do it because we've got you know, there's a mass of information that we've already collated. Right. If anybody does want to ask a question, they have to remember to unmute themselves. I did have uh, occasionally during the talk, there was somebody making noises in the background. I never did work out who oh, it that's was. That's what happened. <laughs> yeah. uh, Tony, uh, Alan Hardman, can I ask you know, Steve Alan. a question? You can. Um, the call that came out of Hemingfield Colliery, uh what's known about where it went to you know was it coke making or domestic or okay so it's barnsley bed so as um, chris will correct me if i'm wrong it's pretty good steam raising coal it's got quite a high calorific value a low a low ash rate it works well it works well for steam raising i can't remember if it's good i've got a feeling it's good for coke making as well so Again, forgive me, we're all of that same era where you can remember where coal was the primary source in your house. You know, this is this this colliery was active before before there was widespread electricity. I don't know if it went for gas making. Um, it may well have gone for gas making too, because Elsica had its own uh, its own gas works, as I'm sure many of you are familiar. All oh, right, thanks. Uh... I see Chris has uh, added to it too. <laughs> yes, for, for those who can't see this, he's saying went to Ironworks, but a lot from uh, Hemingfield went to the uh, GNR, Great Northern Railway, if I translate that right, mm. and the uh, railway supply. So for running steam engines, I imagine. They didn't just yeah. paint it white and make it look pretty, didn't they? 18, 1850, what? Something. Yeah. Oh, 1850, right. <laughs> Uh, are any, uh, oops, just a minute, that's gone off the bottom of my screen. Uh, are open days planned for the future? Have, have you have you actually got a schedule of open days uh, once uh, lockdown has lifted sufficiently? That will go up. I don't think it's up there yet. Chris is, uh, Chris is, the, uh, Chris is my expert on that. We're waiting until confirmation that the, we're hoping from from July onwards, where we will we'll start to reopen periodically. So, uh, you know, do come and do come and rock up. You're very welcome. We'll give you personalised tours. Um, yeah, and uh, show you all the pleasures of Hemingfield. Just changing the angle of my screen so I've got some daylight. <laughs> Oops, I've also got a lower chair. Uh, uh, we, we can, um, if, if you do have a, um, a, a summary, um, a, a flyer on when the open days are, then we uh, should be able to circulate around our membership and uh, people can turn up and drop a few pennies in the hat. No, thank you. I mean, the point I wanted to make was that, you know, we are open and we want to have open behaviour as well. You know, it is obviously, you know, like all of these places, a hazardous site and so on and so forth. So we can't, you know, it's not one where you can just drop in. We also have a bit of a problem with vandalism. So we have to keep an eye on uh, mm. visitors to the uh, unwanted visitors to the site. But on our, on our open days, you really are all very welcome. Right. Uh, yes, uh, I'm, I imagine most of us have had plenty of practice on 
sites like this so we know what we're doing <laughs> or I hope we do um what's turned up here what are the diameters of the shafts that's a really good question and I'm hoping Chris can cover for me the main <laughs> from memory the main what the main winding shafts about 12 or 14 foot across uh and the pumping and the pumping shaft is narrower and about about the same but they've both been the tops of both shafts were reinforced by concrete so they are almost certainly narrower further down there uh you saw from the the photograph i showed you that they're fairly substantial shafts mm. yeah so you can imagine when a cage is going down a shaft with the miners in it you <laughs> it can't be too tiny can it yeah uh, they are, bless him. Thanks, Chris. Ah, right. Yes. An elliptical winding shaft worked by a 30 horsepower, 22 and a half inch vertical cylinder, five foot, six inch stroke engine with flat hemp ropes, later flat wire ropes over a winding drum, nine foot, 11 inches. <laughs> right, I hope that, uh, ah, uh, that, that was the end of the message. The start of it is higher up. So I think the other thing I wanted to stress, Tony, was the reason one of our main purposes is to have a visual prompt for the local mining industry, because with there are very, very few of them left. People may look down the nose at the coal mining industry and understand some of the reasons why. But it was a it was hugely important locally, um, both sort of socially and economically, um, and, uh, and, and deserves some form of, let's say, recognition or or prompt for people to un people that have not experienced living in a coal field to understand some of the aspects of what that entailed. Uh, yes, yes, because. Um, even I came to, I, I've been in South Yorkshire quite a while, but the, uh, in the time I've lived in Sheffield, there's never been a pit in Sheffield. And that's, uh, it's been a while. Arthur Scargill's been here a bit, but we never had any pits. No, that's right. Uh, I believe the main pumping shaft was around nine feet in diameter. Yep, that sounds about right. Uh, So, Tenny, I'm happy if people have, if people want to make individual contacts, um, to do so please through the, uh, the website. You have my details if uh, you yes, yes we can. need. Um, and if anybody wants any further information or is interested in coming and getting involved, um, we, uh, we try and make sure everybody is very welcome. You don't have to come and wield a spade either. There's a whole range of, as a whole range of, or a chainsaw, there's a whole range of non-physical things that, uh, that, uh, that need doing too. Uh, uh, I see some, there's been a reference to Heritage Open Days in September. Uh, should happen. <laughs> right, so if Heritage Open Days do happen in September, you, uh, you'll be on the list of people who will be open then. We can we can send people along when they turn up at our uh, at Wortley Top Forge. We can say you need to go to Hemingfield next. Right. Uh, any more questions? How we have we we exhausted everybody? It's all gone quiet. Uh, if, uh, I've lost my cursor. Ah, we we managed to get up to thirty four participants with the latecomers arriving. So uh, for the people who didn't. Think it started till seven thirty. So I'll uh, once again say thank you very much to Steve for uh, an illuminating talk, and uh, oh, we'll we'll expect him back in ten years when he's uh, when it's uh, a museum to rival uh, various other museums, <laughs> and uh, is, is working. That's well. the plan. No, thank you, everybody. <laughs>